traumatic event, but nearly half reporting exposure to four or more types of traumatic events. And the recent Cal Youth study unfortunately showed too that those foster youth transitioning to adulthood have a greater likelihood of experiencing physical and mental health problems than their non-foster peers. So we knew that mental health was a barrier. Um, I also met with locally uh, 29 of our campus-based foster youth support programs across our community colleges, our CSUs, and our UCs, and met with all of them to ask them what they were experiencing for their students. And across the board, um, everyone was reporting as well that mental health was a significant barrier for their students. Um, and so when we dove a little deeper to better understand what the challenges were, that helped us to figure out what next steps were needed. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, what the colleges were reporting was that the services, while most colleges had counseling services, um, they just weren't enough to meet the needs of their students. Most services are short term, maybe six sessions, not really that long term mental health services and support that our students need. Um, some campuses would have referrals to community based agencies, but in a lot of cases, um, students really were in need of more intensive long-term services on their campus that were easy for them to access. Um, a lot of campuses were reporting that the services were impacted. Maybe there'd be one, maybe two therapists to serve maybe 25,000 students. There's just no way to meet that need. Um, so for the foster youth students, those services were often hard to access, oftentimes wait lists. And there really wasn't a lot of strong intentional coordination with the existing community based mental health resources and services that were out there. A lot of the partnerships were really light touch. Um, and as I mentioned before, they were saying that their students would be interested in having more easily accessible services to meet their needs. So given this, we reached out to our LA County Department of Mental Health to come up with some solutions to get more youth connected to services. Next slide. All right, next one, <laughs> thank you. So to start off in this effort, what we did is we started working with about 10 local community colleges that had expressed that there was a need for their students to have more mental health services. Um, and we partnered with our LA County Department of Mental Health to really just leverage existing resources. So the efforts that we're doing to bring more services on campus to students really isn't costing any extra money. It's using funding, it's using services that are already in place. So I think in general, in most counties, there's a strong history of school-based mental health services and school-based are traditionally at K-12 districts. And so part of this work that we're doing is really expanding that concept of school-based mental health services to include community colleges given the need that we're seeing. And so what we did is we mapped out at all these interested community colleges, um, who are the providers in their area that our county mental health agency was already contracting with that were in a five mile radius. So the goal was to find out who the local providers were connected to each of these community colleges. And then our county department of mental health really just served as a liaison to reach out to the providers to find out who was interested, who had capacity, um, and who wanted to expand their services at these community colleges. And I want to note that what that meant is that there were agencies out there that had unused dollars that the community colleges were able to tap into to serve their students. So I know that, you know, those of you on the call right now are from throughout the state. And so I would imagine if there's unused dollars in LA County, there are definitely unused dollars in your county as well. It's just a matter of reaching out to your local providers and finding out who has capacity to serve your students. And so through this effort, we really just brought interested partners to the table um, that were wanting to establish a relationship. And again, this didn't require any additional funding. It was really two interested parties wanting to form a working relationship together. Um, as part of this, when we worked with the community colleges as well, is really thinking about who needed to be at the table. So we started off our conversations, of course, with the campus-based foster support programs, or in your case, the Next Step programs. Um, but also, usually there was some higher level involvement as well to establish these services. So perhaps the Dean of the EOPNS was involved. Um, and then we definitely recommended and found that it was effective if there was coordination with your existing student health services center. So in many cases, the student health services center played 
a significant role in partnering with the Next Step program to ensure coordination of services. Um, so every college is different though. So some colleges, they had that communication with the Student Health Services program, um, but they didn't really have much involvement. They kind of gave their blessing and said, that sounds great what you're doing, continue on your way. Um, but others were more involved and assisted because they had their own expertise with providing therapeutic services to assist in the development of a referral system. Um, and some campuses chose to just focus on their foster youth, and some chose to focus on their foster youth and other vulnerable student groups, which is why that coordination was also really helpful. And so in this establishment of these services at these campuses, um, we've been meeting with everybody to really form a learning community and gather emerging best practices, um, and we're also assisting to provide technical assistance. So as I go through the slides today, I'll share with you some of the common themes that have been coming up and questions that you might wanna consider in establishing these services at your campus at well, as well. And I know, you know, locally, just to mention too, and that's a career you went to that slide, but you know, we partnered with our LA County Department of Mental Health. And I think if you're in your county and figuring out um, where to start, I would really take a two-pronged approach. I would reach out to your county Department of Mental Health. They're all structured a little different, but you might wanna find out who's in charge of their community-based mental health services. Um, sometimes some of these departments might have a lead for um, child welfare. That might be another good point of contact. Um, but you can also simultaneously just reach out to these agencies directly and find out who's interested and who has the capacity and also the experience in working with your student population. All right, next slide. So this is just an overall process of, you know, what it's been looking like as we work with different campuses and each one's a little bit different. But the initial step is really just initiating that partnership, bringing together the right people, both the right people who have the decision-making authority at your campus, and then also the right people at that local community-based um, mental health agency that have the authority to set up services at your campus as well. And once you've got the right people at the table and you've had those initial conversations, then it's a conversation of figuring out what paperwork is necessary. So, we're actually now working with 12 campuses. Um, all except two have expressed that they need an MOU to establish services at their campus. So that would be a question you'll wanna find out is if you do need an MOU. Um, they're usually pretty simple. They're just to explain that you will be partnering, um, just really to protect anyone against liability. But generally most campuses will want and, and need an MOU to do those services. And we'll share with you some examples as well. Um, but then it's figuring out kind of your internal processes and protocols about how you want to design the referral process, what paperwork is necessary to complete a referral, consent for services, and things of that nature. And then once you develop that process, um, it's really training your staff so everyone is equipped with the same information on know-how to you know, successfully complete a referral, send a referral, what that communication process is going to look like um, before you even start sending the referrals with that agency. So I did wanna share with you, and I think Tia has it, just an example of what one uh, consent for services looks like. If you wouldn't mind pulling that up and we'll email these to you as well. Yes, I have to unshare, but I will let me share this with the group. Hold, please, everyone. Oh, I can see myself now. I know it's kind of weird that you can't we can't see ourselves when we're presenting. Um, and Jessica, if for the one that I'm about to share now, is this an editable thing that people can use? It is, it's just a Word document. So this is an example from Rio Hondo College in LA County. They're partnering with an agency called Crintonton. So they actually chose to both put their logo on the document to help students understand that they are partnering closely together. So your campus will want to set up um, some type of referral form. Most agencies usually have a referral form that they're already working with. It's usually not something that the student fills out themselves, but it's usually something that the staff talks to them and understands what their needs are and helps to fill it out for them on their behalf and then sends it to the agency. 
Um, the other form that we have that we'll share with you is a draft, which is also a Word document, is a consent for services. So what we've found that's been effective at these campuses is um, to have a release of information so that at minimum, you as the next step program coordinator will know if a referral was successful because generally you're going to want to know did they ultimately get linked to services and so if you have that student fill out this type of form it's not saying that you get to know what's discussed in therapy or how it's going but it's simply to say that you'll get a follow-up to make sure that that referral is successful and so what some of these campuses have done is when they send the referral um, ideally, you're going to want an agency that's going to have a quick response time, like within 24 hours, that the, that student gets contacted immediately because they're usually in a crisis and you don't want there to be a delay. And then that consent, um, let's see if we go to that consent, that next document real quick. The one that was under that's it? That's the referral. This one? No. This one? Um, yeah. So the consent for release of information, it's very simple, but then what it does is it allows the provider to follow up in this case with Rio Hondo College. And what they actually did is every week at the end of the week, they would send a list to that college and say, okay, here's all of your students that we're still serving. So they had a sense of how many other students were connected to services. Of course, the student has to consent um, to disclose that information. And so that's what this type of form does. And it's just, it's to pr protect the um, the students and also the campus. You don't want to be sharing any information without the student's consent. And this is an example of one MOU from LA Mission College. Uh, I actually don't have a copy of the MOU with Rio Hondo and Crinton today, but this can give you a sense of what one might look like. And I'm, I'm sure some of our other schools might be willing to share their MOUs as well. But it's again, it's usually very general and it's just to protect everyone against any liability. Um, and, and if you could go back to that release of inform release of information, I just wanted to show that to them. Or not sorry, the consent. Yeah, this is it. No, the um sorry, the referral. Okay. So go. this is an example of what a referral might look like gathers the student's information. And there's usually a reason for referral. And this is where you ideally want to partner with the agency so your staff are trained on how to fill these out appropriately to get them connected to services. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. And again, everyone will be getting um, a copy of all of these documents um, so that you can either Use them for your own, um, for your own, and or um, if you just need something to um, base it on. Okay, let's, great. Let's get all that. You guys, is it okay if I just add something? This is Colleen. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, we do have so for a number of years, um, part of my work was also uh, around mental health services and there's a couple things that we have and that we developed out of our prop 63 efforts that were roughly like 10 years ago but we do have a really cool document that um, sort of walks through all of the kind of questions you would ask when developing an MOU with your Department of Mental Health Services. And then it has some sample language that you could use. So it's very generic, it's, but, but we developed it based on feedback from colleges who are attempting to develop MOUs with their, so you guys have real-time okay. MOUs that you're um, working from, which will be very, very helpful. This document provides some sample language around what you might want to include in an MOU, but it has sort of a um, a step-by-step -step guide of questions you want to ask, who should be involved. And so I'll share that. Um, so as part of the follow-up message that comes to everybody, um, you can just sort of have a guide. It's so, sort of a how-to guide. Awesome. That would be great. Thank you so much. I think sometimes, um, since this is new uncharted territory, some folks mm -hmm. aren't sure where to start in the MOU process. And we do also have another thing. It's a little bit outdated, but I think it could still be helpful and I have to go find it. But it is, here, let me do go this way. Um, it is uh, a big mammoth size spreadsheet 
that includes the contact information for all of the uh, Department of Mental and Behavioral Health at each of the counties. Um, and again, we developed that particular spreadsheet some time back, but it includes all of the county liaisons and at least at that time when they were having their regular meetings um, mm. and just just a lot of information, some of which could be helpful um, if you're trying to do outreach uh, to the departments of mental health in your counties. So I'll grab those two items and make sure that it gets those items get included as part of the follow up from this session. Great, thank you. Awesome. I did, also wanted to make a note that um, if people have questions as we're going through the presentation, um, you please put them in the chat so that we can make sure that we address them. And then, of course, if you're able, if you're able to unmute yourself at the question and answers piece, um, then go ahead and please. But I want to make sure that people can get their questions in there and make sure we address those. Cool. Thanks, Colleen. All right. So are we am I good to mm -hmm. reconvene? <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. All right, you could go to the next slide. So Rio Hondo College was going to join us today to talk about what it's looking like at their campus as an example, but I did just want to share some of the benefits that they've expressed for their students now that they have services up and running for their Guardian Scholar students um, in partnership with that agency I mentioned, Crintonton. Um, for them, these agencies accept Medi-Cal, which is a benefit for their students since most of their students um, do have Medi-Cal. They found it convenient because they're having services now offered on their campus in a designated private and confidential space. Um, they're able to partner with the agency to have these services offered at convenient times that work for their students. And these services are long term, so they're not just six sessions. They're able to meet with the youth um, as, really as long as they need based on their mental health diagnosis. And this agency, and I think this will be the case for most of the agencies throughout the state, is they often have psychiatric services, which is another benefit. They usually have a psychiatrist that they work with, um, usually not one that can come to the college campus, but local in their area. And so that was also a really added benefit for their students is that they could refer them to psychiatric services if they needed medication as well. And that in partnering with this agency, they were really able to ensure a warm handoff for their students so that these referrals were happening quickly the agency was responsive um, and that there was that relationship and rapport built with that agency um, to ensure really high quality services for their students. And as one of the things that they did and will encourage for your campus too, is they created opportunities to build rapport with the therapist. So they brought that therapist into existing events that they already had. And um, you know, for a lot of students, they might be hesitant to start a new relationship with a new therapist. And so the agency was able to come in to different retreats that they already had scheduled for their students and workshops. Um, so the students could get to know the therapist and the agency and know that they're working really closely with the foster youth program. And this helped the students um, build that rapport with the therapist and build that trust more easily. And one of the things I'll talk about um, in the next slide too, is that you really wanna think about creative ways that you can help your students build rapport with that agency or with that therapist. Um, to make it a more natural and seamless transition for services for the students. Next slide. So as we've been doing this work with all the different colleges, I think there's been different questions that have come up and things that you might want to consider. Maybe think about this as a checklist as you're exploring services for your students. Um, one of the first things you want to figure out is really what's the need for your student population? So one college we worked with, for example, they actually surveyed their students to find out who was interested, what days of the week they preferred, what times of days, if their students wanted groups versus individual. Um, so you really wanna get a good sense of what you're looking at for your student population. Um, then of course, you wanna reach out and find an agency in your area that's a good fit. So you might wanna think about questions like if they have experience working with transitional age youth or with trauma, um, but also the capacity of the agency. So some agencies we work with might say, okay, I've got one therapist that we have an opening for to come to your school and they can serve, maybe their caseload is 15 people at a time. Um, 
some campuses might say, well, we have, you know, 50 students we want to serve. So if that agency doesn't have that capacity, some of our colleges are actually partnering with multiple agencies and that's okay too. Um, it really depends on your needs. We, I know one college, for example, they've got one agency that they set up an MOU with to serve their homeless students, another with their foster youth students. Um, I would recommend though that start small when you're starting anything new that get a groove get a system going um, and then build and i think also for these agencies if they start small and then max out on their capacity it's easier for them to then go back to their county and say we need additional funding we're at full capacity um, so that's another thing to think about too another thing agencies might ask you is if the services are intended to be school-based or school-linked um, the work that we are doing are school linked services and that's important school based means that the agency they um, have like their clinical files on campus in your office and for something to be school based it actually requires a much higher level of approval um, but what you're going to want to do is simply school linked which means they don't keep their files at your campus they just come on your campus to provide the therapeutic services to your students um, another thing, as I mentioned before, is you want to think about who needs to be at the table for um, these discussions to happen, like your Department of Student Services, your Next Step Coordinator, your EOPS Dean, um, to be able to make the right decisions to execute an MOU. Um, every campus is different, but I know sometimes certain people need to be at the table to sign off on those types of documents. Um, how long it takes to get an MOU executed really varies. Um, a lot of times schools will need it to go to their board and it can take a little bit of a longer time. So just be prepared that it can you know, take a few months. Um, one of the other things you want to figure out and also one of the things you maybe can ask your students is thinking about um, where these services will be provided. So some, most of these agencies, they have the flexibility. If they're a community-based provider, they can meet with the student on campus, they can meet with the student at a local Starbucks, at a park, in their home. Um, but ideally, you'll want something that's flexible to meet the needs of your students. So see if you can find a physical space on your campus that's private and confidential that a therapist can meet with a student on. Um, but then as services evolve with the student, they might maybe choose to, okay, well, now that I, I know you, maybe it's easier to meet with you at my home or somewhere else. Um, but that's just something you want to think about, too, is where the services will be offered and if there's the option, ideally, to have that space um, available at your campus. So it's just easier for the student to access these services. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned, is outreach. So once you get something up and running, you want to think about how you're going to get your students connected to these services. Um, a lot of these agencies, they have a type of funding called COS dollars, Community Outreach Services, which means that essentially they can meet with students for general outreach before they've opened them for services and started to bill to Medi-Cal. So what some campuses have done, as I mentioned, is either bring them into existing events or activities they have. Um, what other campuses have done is they've started off with groups that are kind of non-threatening, like how to manage stress or how to have healthy relationships, something that maybe students might be more interested in engaging in initially. And those agencies don't necessarily have to open that student yet for services or a bill for Medi-Cal, um, they can have these sort of outreach events um, in the initial phases until they have students that might be more interested in actually starting services. Um, every agency's pot of funding for these community outreach dollars varies, so you'll just want to have a conversation with them about where they're at with that, but they should generally have the flexibility to do these initial outreach services too. Um, and then of course, there's all the paperwork. So as we talked about, you'll want to think about if you need an MOU, what it will entail. Same thing with the referral process. Do you have a referral form, consent for services? And ideally, you want to set up a structure where there's a centralized referral process. So we've seen it be most effective at these campuses where you have a point person at your college and you've got a point person at the agency 
who are communicating with each other to send the referrals. Um, one campus, and it was a learning moment, they sent out the information that they now had these services campus-wide. And so this agency started getting like hundreds of emails from students just everywhere saying they want services. And that was a total mess. <laughs> so then that transitioned into, okay, let's have one point person at the college, send the referrals to the one point person at the agency. And again, that helps you and the agency kind of start small, get something going, find something that works, and then expand with time. Um, so thinking about that as well. And then making sure, again, everyone's just really trained on how to do that referral process successfully for that student. So those are some of the main themes we've been seeing. And as I mentioned, we're working with now 12 community colleges, but we are hoping to continue to gather best practices and lessons learned and share this work uh, so that it can be utilized by any campus throughout the state. And I think I'll actually transition to Colleen on this slide to talk about some of the next steps we'll be doing in partnership with the Chancellor's Office. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so we did um, hear of this incredible uh, sort of collaborative effort that Jessica and the colleges in Los Angeles have been pursuing and uh, reached out and said and first you know sort of dug into some of the details of how of all of the logistics of making this happen and we enjoy the idea of learning from successful models so we're going to do what we call a case study and with Jessica and the colleges down south um, and really document what those processes have looked like and sort of each step of how they got to where they are now where students are actually accessing services. Uh, it's our goal to start on that process, the, the case study process, probably sometime um, in early in next year. Um, and there's a, a couple things. So, so uh, keep an eye out for that. Generally speaking, um, doing a case study takes a handful of months to actually finalize, but we will share that with everyone. Um, some, a couple things that came to mind as I was listening to Jessica um, present, you know, the schools, all of the schools this year did get an allocation for mental health services. They weren't huge allocations, but every all of the 114 schools got an allocation for mental health services and what I understand and that was for the provision of direct services um, to be able to create space on campus to provide uh, mental health services and to do training and outreach so uh, most of the time these dollars live within the health center and so if you haven't already done outreach to the person at your campus who runs a health center. So for the record, there's about 70 of the community colleges that have a brick and mortar health center. We've documented that 90 to 95 of the schools offer some level of mental health services. Generally, this is short term up to six visits per semester. But I think it's important to recognize that this infrastructure, while it's limited, um, it it does exist. So for those of you on campus who are not connected with your health services person or who are not connected with um, the individuals who are the counselors, the mental health professional uh, folks on your campus, I think it's important to get connected. And I think to Jessica's point, I think it's really important that there be that sort of triangular coordination because a lot of times or in some instances, your health services is already engaged with community-based providers depending on what depending on what it looks like at your campus in the provision of health and mental health services so i think it is really important to at a minimum reach out to your health professionals and reach out to the mental health professionals at your campus to say hey look I'm, i want to engage with our county behavioral health folks and set up co-location set up a formal referral process because the health and the mental health professionals on your campuses um, they know about HIPAA. They know about 
the rules and the provisions. They know about FERPA and HIPAA, right? So you've got both of those gatekeeps around student confidentiality. And I don't want to make this more complicated than it needs to be, but those folks are deep in the weeds of understanding those laws. So it makes sense to bring those people into the loop as you guys try to set something up. So that was probably more than what you were expecting <laughs> on this slide, but I just thought, think it's important to sort of learn from what we know from past efforts around um, engaging with the counties. And I will say, you know, I don't have a spreadsheet that tells me exactly how much unspent money that they have, but word on the street is that they have a fair amount of, of of funding available to try to engage other community entities, including community colleges. And I think one other thing, wait, before one other thing I wanna say is, and I, I mentioned this to Jessica and Tia before we hopped on the call, is that the chancellor's office, and hopefully this is not another slide somewhere later in the deck, but um, the, you know, this year in the 1920 budget, we, for the first time in 10 years, um, got a $7 million allocation from Prop 63. So Prop 63 is a Mental Health Service Act and it funds much of the county work. And so this is the first year in, I would say 10 years that we were able to successfully lobby to get $7 million specifically of Prop 63 dollars. Those dollars are being distributed to the schools through a competitive process. We're at the very tail end of that. There'll be 15 schools that get selected to be grant um, grantees of that effort. And I will share that information with you once it's provided, once it's finalized. Right now we're in the appeals process um, for that competitive process. But the Chancellor's Office in terms of its 2021 pri uh, budget priorities, did submit to the governor's office a uh, budget change proposal, it's called a BCP, um, to request $10 million of ongoing Prop 63 dollars. And the ideal configuration of that is all 114 schools would get some of that $10 million if we're successful. So um, I think, it's important a to be able to get the money and get the resource and open the prop 63 door um, for potentially more money but also just the fact that the state agency um, has prioritized this is pretty incredible um, i've been working in this space for a while and you know there's always a ton of competing priorities and this is the first time I've observed the, this, our agency going to the governor's office and saying, hey, this is a real need and we need to um, start leveraging uh, our need with existing resources, AKA through the Mental Health Services Act. So I, I think um, there's a few things that I wanna send to you guys. Um, we have a really cool website. It doesn't, it doesn't provide direct services to students. So let's be real clear about that. It's not, there's not any live online counseling on there, but there's a number of resources that can be useful to you as you start to endeavor into connecting around mental health services and best practices. Um, we do have um, a really cool uh, curriculum uh, called Healthy Transitions that we developed as part of our Prop 63 about 10 years ago. And I won't go into the details. I'm just going to send you guys the link. But since you guys as part of Next Up have the charge of doing workshops and prevention um, services with your students, you can look through these materials and um, there's trainer guides there's a peer to peer um, component to it. It's just a super rich curriculum that again, isn't providing direct mental health, clinical mental health services to your students, but it's a really good resource to do prevention. It's a really good um, resource to start a conversation about our wellness needs to the young people. And it was designed specifically for transition age foster youth. So. There's a handful of things that I'll send to you guys. I'll send to Tia and then that can get distributed with the larger um, follow-up message. And I'm open to any questions if anybody has any. Sweet, I think at this point, Jessica, unless there's anything else that you wanted to add to that, we can transition to questions. The only thing I was just gonna add really quickly just to echo what Colleen was saying about the importance of coordinating with your existing Student Health Services Center is 
As she mentioned, they may already have existing relationships with agencies that they're doing referrals with. Sometimes it's just a matter of making the ask and letting them know that there's a need for your students to prioritize your foster youth students. Um, in the case of College of the Canyons, they were actually partnering with another agency to serve their CalWORK students. So it was just a matter of them surveying their students. They came back to that agency and said, look, like 85% of our students say they want services. And then that agency was more than um, open to now additionally providing co-located services for their foster youth students. But it was just a matter of um, initiating the conversation and making the ask. So sometimes they may not even know that there's a specific need for your program. But otherwise, that's all I have. Um, Cool. So this is um, this is the space of those of you who have never joined one of these calls before to where you can ask questions. Um, maybe you on your campus is actually um, doing something. Maybe it's not exactly this model, but you are doing something. Typically, this is where we go into small group discussions. But the last time we did one of these, um, it seemed to be really fruitful that we didn't go into small groups and just went straight up into a full large conversation. Um, and so if uh, you wanted to put in the chat box, you can ask a question or you can simply unmute yourself and ask a question, make a comment. Um, again, this is really no like formal way. You don't have to address me as ma'am. <laughs> um, you can really ask questions. I just want to put one one last statement out before we go to Q&A, and that is the work that's happening in Los Angeles with the, between the community colleges and the Department of Mental Health Services and their subcontractors. That's groundbreaking. Um, th we've been working to try to support colleges to have exactly what Jessica and these colleges are working on, formal MOUs in place. So the tools and the things that are happening, um, it's incredible. So just wanted to say it's, that's been something that folks have been working on for years. Awesome. And if you are on the call and you are from one of the um, LA campuses and maybe you have something to add to that Jessica has worked with and you have something to add to this, um, please, um, we recognize that in today's conversation, we didn't have a campus perspective, which I apologize for. Um, so if you are at a campus that has been working um, with Jessica's, I'm gonna call them the core 10 right now, um, <laughs> then uh, please make sure that you say something. Otherwise you can unmute yourself and ask a question or make a comment. And I did also have um, 10 campuses that had identified that they do have some kind of mental health coordinated effort that's happening on their campus. So if you were one of those 10 um, and you could share what you are doing on your campus, that would also be helpful. We do have people on the call who do not have anything that's happening as far as um, mental health services that can, this could be really helpful to hear what's happening across the state. So I guess I'll just start with a question to the folks on the phone. Um, and it, it's pretty direct. It's, you know, are you all connected with your health services or, or if you have a standalone mental health services on your campus, or if those two are embedded together, how many people are connecting with that group of on your campus, like how many have health centers, how many are getting connected with the health centers. I know Rebecca you are. I think. Well, um, when we first started our program, um, we actually had an MOU with our student health services and we were able to hire a therapist that uh, had specific uh, transitional age foster youth experience. And so we were able to have a therapist on campus that provided workshops for our program and also provide one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling, either at student health or in our office. And we had that person for, I think it was like about a year, um, but there were a lot of like rules because we we're using NEXA funds for that specifically. Mm -hmm. And we had to have, make sure that the director of um, student health was a person managing the therapist. Mm -hmm. So um, we did have interest with a couple of students, but um, what we found was just that it was a lot of money to put into it. Um, and we just didn't have enough interest to make it sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, so now what we've done is we've worked with our student health um, office and we give referrals um, to, if it's something that's just like immediate short term, we refer our students to our psychological services here on campus. And if not, we actually still are in touch with that therapist we had hired 
Mm -hmm. And so um, he accepts Medi-Cal, and so we just refer students to him directly through his private practice. Um, and that's actually worked out really well because he has that experience. He kind of knows how things are here on campus, and he has that perspective. Um, and so that's actually worked out well. So we use both depending on the case with the student. I would really love to come up with something like what you have in LA, because I'm finding because we had started out having using next up funds here on our campus, um, the administration is kind of like, well, you have your funds, why don't you just use that? Like, let's do what you had done initially. And I'm trying to like not do that. Right. that way. And, and you know, something about that, and, and it is in the law that says you can, right? It's, it's a perfectly allowable use but your next up funds are only going to go so far. Right. It's right. If, if you're responsible for all the academic support, if you're responsible right. for giving need grants, if you're responsible for emergency grants. So I think that, that what's happening here is really, really important. Sort of looking at the long view mm -hmm. of what's, you know, once we all sort of, once the dust settles and we get into our regular budget groove based on the number of students that we're serving and all those good things, you know, next up is only going to go so far. And the provision right. of mental health services, clinical services, or even prevention services, th th those can become very expensive. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of leveraging students' Medi-Cal eligibility is brilliant. Mm -hmm. That's what those, that's what it's there for. It's just about bridging to, you know, to get access to either funded services or um, someone who will be able to bill Medi-Cal. Has there been any, um, it seems like our student health services wanted to be very involved in terms of if we were, if we were bringing someone from the outside to come to our campus to provide therapy services. Do you know if any of the schools in LA had any issues with like having people from other agencies come to provide that service specifically? Was there any like pushback from any of the colleges? Um, most of them not, but I think to be honest, there was one or two where I think the people can get a little territorial for lack of a better word and were maybe not really understanding what this would mean for them, that it wasn't to replace what they're doing or supplant their work, but to allow them the capacity to expand those services. So I think it then just became a little bit of providing education to them. I think sometimes people thought, well, I'm gonna have to supervise this therapist, it's gonna mm -hmm. be more work for me. So it was also educating them that this wouldn't be any additional work for them. And it, you know, they were seeing that they didn't have the capacity to meet all their right. students. So this was really just to support them. And I think there has been a range of how involved student health services have been involved. All of the campuses, we've asked that they at least communicate with them. And some campuses mm -hmm. have chosen, the student health services have chosen to not be involved. Um, and other campuses are highly involved. And, and that's a positive thing because they're helping to triage, to do referrals. Some of these agencies have a lot of capacity. So in some colleges, they're serving their next up students and other vulnerable students like EOPNS students in general. So having someone with that expertise has been helpful to the EOPNS department. So I think it really, um, there's a range in their level of involvement. At uh, Rio Hondo, for example, it's their clinical staff that are the central point person for their referrals. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas I can think of another college where it's all through their Guardian Scholars program. I'm really excited about this model. I feel like it's something that's definitely oh, great. in our area, um, especially since we've been having a lot of like issues with like natural disasters yeah. <laughs> um, in our mm. area. And so to have something like this, not only for our population, but for a good number of our students would be. Yeah. Really and cool. I think the selling point is that it's not going to have to use your dollars to yeah. serve the students and you can leverage existing dollars that are out there um, to have more money for other needs the students might have. Thank you. You know, and I would say one thing, you know, it takes a fair amount of effort. Most of the times you're going to have to have an MOU in place um, because of the work that's, you know, being supported, mental health services. If, if you have capacity to bird dog an MOU, um, I think sometimes that's a limiting factor for people in the health centers is that it does take a bit of bird dogging to get an MOU in place and to even start that relationship building. Um, 
It's a bird dog. A bird dog. <laughs> well, you know, bird dog, you know, they, uh, um, that's not the, it, they, they go chase things down, right? Oh. They, they go, they do the leg work, they, um, they follow up, they, they keep bird dogging. So hopefully oh, okay. it, we'll, we'll send it as part of the follow up. We'll send a Google definition. Of bird dog. Um, it just means Perfect. if you're willing to do the leg work, got it to pursue an MOU, I think that people in the health centers are oftentimes so deeply, just like you guys, but I don't think that the schools necessarily pursue MOUs um, with the Department of Mental Health because A, they're very busy and B, they don't really necessarily know what all is involved. And a lot of times that means conferring with legal on campus. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's just lots of pieces to that and it's a worthwhile investment. So if you independently have the capacity to bird dog that, I'm sure that the people at the health center would probably try to be supportive of that. Yeah. And what we've seen some colleges do is if it does take a while for their campus to get approval of an MOU and go through all those steps, some of our colleges are just in the interim. They're still getting their students connected to mm -hmm. services. They're doing referrals. Um, so maybe they're not having them on campus in their office, mm -hmm. but they're at least getting them connected until they get that formal MOU in place. Since it can take some time. Yep. Cool. Um, I'm actually going to um, call out, Jeremy is on the call from Riverside Community College District and you had mentioned that you're, you know that there are campuses that are doing like coordinated mental health efforts, Jeremy, if you can unmute yourself and share what Riverside is doing, um, I think that would also be helpful. Um, and Ruth, also I know you're from Norco, if you had something also to add to that. I totally volunteered you, Jeremy, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, I can't hear you. It looks like he's ah, unmuted. I see you're unmuted. Ah, sadness. Oh, we can't hear you, Jeremy. Maybe he doesn't have a mic. Now. Yeah. Well, maybe we can follow up with Jeremy and just get a couple, you know, a paragraph or two about what they're doing so we don't lose the momentum. Yeah, I want to, I definitely want to know, and Ruth, um, here over at Norco, do you want to share what you guys are doing over at Norco? I, you're still muted. Unmute. There, can you hear me? there we go. I can hear you. Yes, okay. Um, so we're still navigating through some challenges with mental health services. Um, right now, our, our department's in transition. So we had a full-time, you know, practitioner there um, and um, a full-time assistant that would man the desk but was trained in all of these um, areas. They both uh, got promoted to a different college so we're transitioning now and I just got out of a behavioral intervention team meeting where we're trying to navigate how to navigate through the office that's closed frequently because there's no staffing but that's so imperative especially to our population. So I was going to ask what are the best practices for other institutions. You know, we've, we've had an informal um, um, agreement that if a Phoenix scholar comes down to um, the health services that they'll be given priority placement with the, the most seasoned professional. Um, we're privileged to have one of our, our main therapists that has history and works with traditional issues. And um, our students have been really, um, had probably positive interactions and feedback from them. Um, but when the health services close and emergencies arise, where the student may not be a danger to themselves or others, but they're in crisis, um, the, the college doesn't know what else to do besides refer them to the police, um, which are trained um, to help de-escalate situations, but it's just alarming when uh, to have someone in uniform come and try to de-escalate. So I was wondering about best practices from hopefully one of those 10 LA, LA uh, community colleges about how you navigate when your health service is understaffed um, and is the police the next option, if it's the only option, and how do you help advocate for a better solution? Yeah. Um, when prices arrive. <laughs> oh. Sorry, team. No answers here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think that you're bringing up a really great point of, you know, which I think Jessica had brought up the capacity building. <laughs> uh, 
um, doing partnerships with your community partners of making sure that they have the capacity and the therapists and this the it's very real what happens when you when they don't have <coughs> for it. Um, Jessica, do you have anything to add to that or maybe experiences that you've seen from LA? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just what you were saying that if the Student Health Services Center doesn't have the capacity and they are understaffed, that's, I think, just more reason to want to partner with a local agency so that you can build that capacity for your students um, so they can get that one on one support. Um, ideally, to prevent a crisis, you know, if we can get them connected earlier on and sooner before these crises arise, that's ideal too. Now, I don't this isn't my area of expertise. I know at least in LA County, there's also crisis response services and programs. And I think that's probably in every county, but I'm not 100% sure. But a lot of times there's um, those types of services that the colleges can also leverage where they'll partner and come in for you know, crises as needed. But I think you know, ideally want to get them services before that. So a couple things come to mind. I think the health services folks in general are understaffed. Um, they don't get any state, they don't get any uh, like base funding. It's all based on the health fee that the students pay. So as a general rule of thumb, the health centers are, you know, oftentimes operating over capacity. Um, and maybe you guys already know this, but I, I definitely know this. Um, and I think it would be worth us investigating. So Jessica, what you were talking about around um, uh, emergency crisis intervention from the county level, like sort of after hours, I think it would be worthwhile to investigate how many counties actually have that service. And if there's some way to act, like, is there a hotline? Is there a, I don't know the answer to this, but I'm saying I think it would be worthwhile knowing. Yeah, and I can ask around to find out if it's just a local county service or if that's statewide. I just, I'm just not totally sure. Right, because I think, and over the years, a lot of times, and I know lots of schools have behavioral intervention teams or care intervention teams and, and those kind of things, which is good and helpful, but after hours, um, a lot of times it is the police that get called, and, that, and a lot of times that is not their... And it, they have a hard job too, of course, but they're not going to be necessarily looking through a therapeutic lens. They're not going to be looking through a prevention lens. They're going to be, you know, hopefully trying to de-escalate a crisis, but it's just a very different approach. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and can be more triggering yep. for students too if they have to interact with uh, someone in a uniform. Yep. We could just make the situation even more escalated. Especially for young people who have got um, background of system involvement, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times for them, that's, that's a bad, bad, bad thing. Um, so. Absolutely. Um, I am curious from the other campuses, and maybe you can put in the chat or you can unmute yourselves of if you have, maybe you started to um, get some kind of coordinated effort on your campus and for whatever reason it didn't happen. Maybe there was staffing turnover, maybe a barriers from administration. What is it that you're seeing on your campuses that, um, that you are seeing? Because what you are experiencing may likely be what another campus is experiencing as well. I'll keep an eye on the chat or unmute yourself. I can add something to um, some of the questions we get sometimes is what about your undocumented students. So that's come up in some of our meetings. Um, a lot of these these agencies all have a certain amount of funding for indigent students, students who are uninsured. So some of the agencies you might want to work with might have funding to meet those students needs, but just to be also transparent, those funding fundings are usually pretty limited. Um, so that might just be a barrier you might come up with for those students is that the agencies might have funding or very limited funding, depending on how many students you have that might be uninsured. Something to keep in mind, too. Yeah, very, yeah, very quiet group today. Typically, we talk a lot. <laughs> it, must, it must be the close to the turkey holiday. We all just want to eat and go on break. Um, I do also want to know, and I don't know if Jessica, this is something that has been addressed uh, your campuses and um, or Colleen of like our LGBTQI students 
Um, and I was also, I don't remember who I was talking to at Blueprint of um, really noting and having conversations about the mental health of our men of color in our programs um, and making sure that we are addressing their needs as well. I mean, I know that I could, at least speaking from my own experience of working with programs um, and creating my own program, um, that was a blind spot that we had that we needed to address immediately. And so as you're developing programs and you are looking at your populations and your students, making sure that we're not leaving those students behind um, as we talk about undocumented and LGBTQI and our men of color, um, you know, as well. I don't know if anybody has experience in that or wanted to add. And I think that really speaks to sort of cultural competent services, culturally competent services that are recognizing that um, different cultures, you know, there's some stigma embedded in um, in accessing services and sort of recognizing that it's okay to get help. Um, and so a lot of times uh, um, students, they are gonna, they're not gonna disclose and, but it's just gonna manifest. And again, I'm telling you guys stuff you all know cause you're right there with the students, but um, to just sort of recognize that um, all those behaviors that are manifesting is really just a, a way of saying I need some help, um, but I don't know if it's okay to ask and I don't know how to ask. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, the people around me are, um, what is the right word? They're um, sort of dismissing this concept that, um, or they're actually making me feel worse about needing help. And so it's this whole conversation um, around coaxing people into knowing it's okay to get help. Yeah, and, and, and the, I totally agree. Uh, once again, Colleen, hit it on the dot, you know, on the head. Um, I, around this conversation in mental health support, like we know our, our centers on campus are understaffed, we know it's best practice, you know, to reach out and still live in my youth with outside agencies. So there's, there's a clear pathway um, of what to do. But those conversations on the back end too with yeah. how do we help these behavioral intervention teams, how do we start this conversation without uh, appearing as enabling. I'm hearing the enable that you were, I don't like it, uh, but the, the enabling conversation of, well, they need to learn how to act. And it's like, but these behaviors are from traumatic experiences that right. are very real. So when they reach out for help or their behaviors are, are uncomfortable, right? Yep. Um, how do we help these students not feel disenfranchised from receiving the services other students that they need? Because um, they know it's frustrating for, to professionals, but at the same time, they have a right to the services and we need to help them develop into successful students. And it's easy to take the easy ones, the students who are already yep. behaving properly. But that's what I could be funding for. So yep. those conversations I'm, I'm trying to um, have. So, so just curious, you know, and because uh, Ruth, you're by no means alone, right? You're in a crowded room with people who are all probably experiencing the same thing, right? Um, one thing that comes to mind is, and we did host two trauma-informed care trainings, right? And we invited everybody who wanted to come from any campuses. I think helping to educate your BIT team or your care team, I mean, you know, some of the BIT teams, I mean, 10 years ago, there wasn't, there was five schools that had a BIT team, right? Now all of them have a care team or a BIT team. Yeah. Um, but some bit teams or care teams are coming from the lens of like campus liability, yep. um, really from a more punitive platform. Like we're gonna manage the problems, right? There's other care teams and bit teams and um, environments on campus that actually recognize prevention and early intervention and how that can actually enable a student to get into recovery. Um, and to get on the path. I, I can't tell you how to manage your BIT team or how to manage the culture on your campus because that's a really tricky thing. But maybe just starting with some trauma-informed care training or um, even just planting those seeds, right? Planting the seeds that, A, these are students from our community and it's our obligation to serve them, right? They come 
with some extra stuff. And it's our job as, as community members to, fit, to help sort that out. Um, I don't have a silver bullet, you know, to tell you what to tell administrators, but helping people understand the trauma lens, I think is probably the best place to start. And then introducing your students to them, right? Taking your students and, and actually introducing a student. I think um, there's a handful of schools who have made it their mission to really help educate um, their administration about the, the trauma that, that, that has impacted some of these young people and how hard they're working to try to you know, change the trajectory for themselves and oftentimes their younger sibling and oftentimes their own offspring. So um, again, that's not a silver bullet. You know, it's not, there's not an easy answer about how you change the culture on campus about recognizing trauma and recognizing that behavior that um, to the campus administration is like, you know, what? Like, oh no, you know, get out, get, get yourself under control. And then once you're better, then come back um, to recognizing that those are things that those young people developed as um, survival mechanisms in their whole childhood, right? Um, so it's just about educating and it's not easy and it's not quick. It's now what I will say is that um, our system and individual institutions have come a long, long way in terms of getting it. And so, you know, we can give a little snap a catch up for that, but, um, but there's not an easy answer. It's just about educating them. And that's a gradual process. And then new people come and you got to start over and you guys, your leaders hop around all the time. Unsatisfying answer, sorry. Actually very satisfying. So thank you. <laughs> Educate on. We do. <laughs> all right, well, I think I haven't seen any other questions come in through the chat. Um, I do wanna close with if there are any resources that we had talked about that maybe I don't, I missed once I send out the follow-up email, please shoot me an email and be like, hey, you missed this. I really need this for my campus. Um, thank you so much, Jessica, for um, hopping on our call today to talk about what's happening in LA. I'm super excited. I guess you're Thanks for having me. I work with Jessica. Really big um, kudos, big, big <laughs> kudos. Oh, thank you guys. Groundbreaking stuff down there. Um, well, please feel just, free to reach out to me if you have any questions too. Um, my email is pretty easy. It's jessica at jbay.org. And I'll make sure that I put that um, in our follow-up email as well. Um, and Jessica, if there, is there a way that people can stay connected with what's happening? I saw that there's a learning community potentially, or is there like a meeting that happens that people are, can join? I mean, if there's the anyone on the call that's in LA, they can reach out to me and I can work with them and DMH to get them connected. Um, if they're not in LA, I think next steps will be the work that we're doing with Colleen's office to document a case study and then continue to document best practices so we can get this out as we continue to learn um, how things are going on a local level too. Um, I'm going to quickly piggyback on that. If they're like slightly local to LA, let's say we have like Riverside, we have San Bernardino on the call. Um, if, is there a way that I'm, if they know, maybe there's an in that they, LA has that we can leverage? <clears throat> I mean, the work we're doing is specifically with LA County mm -hmm. agencies and providers. Um, so they wouldn't be the folks to connect them to resources in a different county, but they should get connected with their county department of mental health for sure and find out who their local providers are. Got it. So let me see if I can dig up the big old mammoth spreadsheet that has all 58 counties and their departments of behavioral health. Again, it's not like a super current one, but at least it's a semi starting place. Oh, um, awesome. To see if that winds up bearing any fruit for folks. Great. All right. Thank you so much, Colleen, um, and everyone here on the call. Have a great day and have a great Thanksgiving if you are celebrating Thanksgiving next week. And have a great one, everyone. And thanks for thanks participating. Everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone.